In Roman times, we had legions and a very complex, very efficient military machine. In modern times, the armed forces are complex and structured organizations that give a lot of options and capacities to country leaders. Between the two, there have been centuries where the organization of military affairs haven't been so structured. This is the story of those centuries. Coming up. Welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. So everybody is familiar with the classic Roman military organization we studied at school. There were the legions, the very famous legions. The legions were also able to generate what we would call today mission-specific task forces, the so-called vexillaciones, which in the late Roman Empire will become permanent units and obviously the organization of the army was much more complex. There were the auxilia, the auxiliary troops, there were engineers, permanent units, very well organized, there was logistics, there was a number of assets that we find also in the modern world. With the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476, this kind of tradition was lost in the western part of the Roman Empire. In the eastern part, it will go on for centuries, or a bit about for more than a thousand years. But in the western part, the barbarian traditions actually took over. But now, I know that today they're usually called migrations, but yes, they're the same barbaric invasions that you have studied at school, okay? It will take a thousand years before a new type of organization began to emerge, and three more centuries to see anything comparable to the Roman military organization. During the Middle Ages, armies were not a permanent institution. They were raised by the monarch when it was necessary, so their organization was much, much, much simpler. The main type of unit in a medieval army was the company or the band, just different names. They were centered around a nobleman or a landowner. They were composed of people who actually sworn their allegiance to the nobleman, or anyway, they pledged their services to the nobleman and were part of his household. They were normally what we, in later time we will call knights, and they were basically professional soldiers. So people raised from their uh, youth to be soldier and trained for war since then. They were normally the best equipped in an army. They had armor, they had horses, and they normally formed the heavy cavalry together with some other fighters that had a decent armor or a decent equipment. They rallied around their master standard and they usually fought together. No use to say there was no formal rank system in place. Subcommanders were appointed by the nobleman on the basis of personal trust or more often nobility. Also, the logistic associated with maintaining a knight on the field was also left to the knight themselves. So the knights and these professional soldiers brought with them squires or servants or even the family during their campaign. From a military point of view, the main problem was that there was no uniformity. The weapons varied, the training was left to the personal attitudes of people. Um, also, the units have different sizes. Uh, a band or a company could be a dozen people or a couple of hundred depending on uh, the, 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 the wealth of the nobleman organizing it and also the chain of command that was established on the fly in the field had to uh, consider the different levels of nobility. So a medieval army was an aggregation of potentially hundreds of these companies between the high commander and the nobleman, there was pretty much nothing. So it's pretty clear that 
an army like this was a nightmare to command and was incapable of doing any kind of complicated action, any kind of complicated maneuver on the battlefield. There was actually an established tradition to split an army in three groups, a vanguard, a main battle and the rear guard, but that was exactly a temporary aggregation. The lack of any structure within these three main groups actually forced the group commander to use uh, its forces as an undifferentiated uh, mass of people on the battlefield. The complexity was also increased by the fact that in a medieval army you could easily find two other types of units. So when an army was raised, the king didn't just ask the nobleman to provide their forces. The same request was sent to towns, hamlets and all other territorial establishments. These actually provided forces on their own and the quality was extremely variable. Um, for example, a town could have some reasonably wealthy people who could afford some decent weapons so they could become uh, decent infantry on the battlefield. They could also provide, for example, semi-professional bowmen. It was typical in England. In some cases, the troops were just peasants with no more than agricultural tools as weapons, so they were relatively useless on the battlefield. They were, so again, great fragmentation of units, no standards, uh, no uniformity. The third type of unit that you could find in a medieval army was the mercenaries. Mercenaries were organized in bands or uh, companies as well, uh, with the difference that they were raised by a captain, by a mercenary captain, and the man was actually in a business relationship with the captain directly, who was supposed to find them a job in exchange for their uh, combat capacity. Often the armies uh, refer to mercenaries to acquire capacities that they didn't have. For example, famous in medieval times were the Genoese crossbow men that fought for the whole of Europe, or later, toward the Renaissance period, there would be the Swiss mercenaries. Obviously, their main allegiance was to their employers' coffins. So by now you should have understood how a medieval army was not very flexible and very difficult to control at all. And this actually reflected uh, into the nature of the operation during that time. We don't have description of clever campaign plans in which an army is actually split into different bodies that try to outmaneuver the enemy and acquire the superiority through a clever uh, employment on the battlefield, through clever operations. On Even on the battlefield where the uh, geographical proximity of all the troops uh, on the battlefield would actually have allowed uh, some more uh, control and some more complex uh, operations, well, so quite often chivalric consideration prevailed and, well, taxes tended to be not very sophisticated. Situation started to change in the 15th century when the improving economy of Europe actually allowed kings and noblemen to uh, increase the percentage of mercenaries in their armies. Colonels, rich noblemen or professional soldiers were issued a commission to rise a regiment between 1,000 3,000 men. We still have the documents and they clearly state how many soldiers have to be raised, their equipment, their moral and physical qualities, uh, how many days of supplies they should be provided with. And they also go into great detail about uh, the pay of non-commissioned officers, uh, the pay of subordinate officers. As a curiosity, it is in this period that kings and generals start to review their troops and just to make sure that all the soldiers that they are paying for are actually present. So, a 16th or 17th century army would have a commander with a number of regiments of uh, infantry or cavalry under him. Regiments on the imminence of a battle or of a siege were going to be divided into divisions, uh, the classic uh, vanguard, main battle, rear guard, or left, center, right,
sometimes there was a cavalry commander, sometimes there was uh, an artillery commander. At regimental level, we also see the birth of the battalion as a subunit of the regiment. It's happened in Spain. Below that level, we still find a company commanded by a captain as the basic building block of a regiment. Sometimes, especially with mercenaries, entire companies were hired by the colonel and just became one company of the regiment. So, an army like this was definitely much more maneuverable than the medieval counterpart. It is, in fact, in this period that we start seeing again campaigns where armies uh, start using mobility to try to put themselves in a better position and gain the advantage over the enemy. A good early example is the campaign of 1503 in southern Italy, where the army command, the Spanish army commanded by Gonzalo de Cordoba, had to defend uh, the south of Italy and Naples from the invading French coming from the north. With a series of clever movements and using the terrain in his favor, he was able to defeat the French by deceiving them and then attacking them by surprise. It is actually a very exciting story. It is probably worth a video on its own. However, all of this changed at the beginning of the 18th century. Standing armies became increasingly common and increasingly large and this brought standardization with it. So, first of all, a coherent ranking system took root everywhere. Secondly, our familiar regiment, battalion, company, platoon structure became the norm and it was commonplace. Drills and equipment became standardized because they were acquired by the state. The Prussian army uh, under Frederick I and Frederick II became a master of this newly uh, found idea of organization. However, crucially, we have to note that above the regimental level in the 18th century, there still was nothing. The organization was still decided on the fly, on the battlefield, in large divisions created for the specific task, for the specific occasion. However, our story ends here because we have already dedicated a three video series to the development of division as a fighting unit. So, thank you for watching. Goodbye.